Matthias Siebler joins me this week to talk about hop farming in Germany. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 230. This is Beersmith Podcast number 230, and it's early February 2021. Matthias Seibler joins me this week to talk about hop farming in Germany. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're offering access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. For more information, again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. If you've not downloaded the new 3.1 update, update, grab it now as it includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, new add-ons, and much more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to beersmith.com today. Again, that's beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Matthias Seibler. Matthias founded Hops to Brew in 2015 with the goal of linking together hop growers, researchers, and the brewing industry. He's a 10th generation German hop farmer with degrees in civil engineering and a master's in agriculture. He joins us today from uh, Bavaria. Great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Fine. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I understand your family has actually been growing hops in Germany for 10 generations. Is that right? Yes, that's right. But in the end, it's not a special thing here in Germany, as uh, we we do grow hops for many centuries, and most of them don't know that they they grow it even longer than ten generations. Oh my goodness! I mean, that's that's pretty incredible. So now, are, are you on a how how large is your farm? Sorry, I was saying, how big is your farm? How many uh, hectares so, do you uh, have? Hec- we 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 count in hectares, so. We have uh, 75 hectares of uh, acreage, and we grow about 30 hectares of hops on, on this farm. And together with the fellow uh, uh, hop growers, uh, we, they are approximately of the same size. So the average size in, 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 uh, in the Hollertau is, is around about uh, 25, 25 hectares. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And you're, um, you're located in, in Bavaria, right? Yes, so it's south of Germany, as the middle of Europe, south Germany, Bavaria, and quite in the middle of Bavaria, and north of Munich, where the Oktoberfest takes place, and uh, in between Munich and Ingolstadt. Ingolstadt is uh, where is Audi is produced, for example. So in the middle of Bavaria, yes. Yeah, I was looking at you're almost halfway between Stuttgart and Munich, I think, right? Yeah, approximately. Yeah. Um, well, our, our family owned hop farms, are they common in Germany? Is this a, is this a common thing? And is, is the area you're in, uh, where a lot of the hops are grown? Well, there's not a single farm that is not family grown, uh, f- family owned. Uh, we, we're really talking about family, family run farms. And, uh, there's not, uh, it's in this case, it's different from, from uh, the U S right. There's uh, uh, a lot more corporate or larger companies uh, growing hops here, I think. Um, yes, that's it. So uh, is the German hop market a lot different than the U.S. as well? Well, yes. Uh, if you have a closer look at the numbers, uh, if Germans always compare themselves with the U.S. and the U.S. with Germany, that's amazing because uh, Germany is much smaller mm-hmm. and uh, – when 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 I say that we compare them with the U.S., we mean in the north northwestern Pacific states, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, where the hops are grown in in the U.S., and we have more or less the same output. Uh, means uh, appro- uh, approximately 100 million pounds of hops. Wow! It's the same. It's the same amount in 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 the U.S. and in Germany. Even if Germany has uh, about 10 
uh, 10,000 acre less hmm. uh, 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 acreage. And uh, what's amazing is that the output of alpha is uh, is too uh, the same. So we it's about uh, five point four uh, thousand mit metric tons. So metric tons, not uh, that's not okay. Pounds. Yeah. So five point four uh, thousand metric tons produced in Germany, and the same number, the same uh, amount is produced in in the U.S. And um, so this is basically. Basically, what what it is like, and together we produce. As a together, I mean the U.S. and Germany. Only those two regions or countries um, produce eighty percent of all hops worldwide. That's incredible. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I didn't know German. The German hop market was that large. Is is the vast majority of it grown in that same area of Bavaria where that where you live? Uh, uh, so we are talking about the hop market. We uh, only the production of hops. The market or the need of hops is is of course not that high. So therefore, Germany is too small. Of course, even if you produce a lot of beer. <laughs> well, is it is it is it all grown in the area that you live in? Roughly, is is, is yeah, there an area mostly. in in Germany where they're primarily grown? I know in the in the U.S. it's primarily the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, uh, in the U.S. it's uh, mostly in, in the in the Pacific Northwest. In in Germany, it's mostly in in uh, in the Hollertau, in the center of in the center of Bavaria, but also in the in the in the, in the regions Tettnang and Spalt and Hersbruck, who gave names to uh, certain hop varieties. Maybe you know that. And then in eastern Germany, that we call Elbisale, and. There are some hotspots, newcomers who started growing hops, but in the end, it's mostly the Hollertau in the center of Bavaria. That's is there is there is there only that variety grown, or is there other varieties grown uh, in your area? Uh, we have about forty different varieties that we grow, uh, basically German varieties, but of course um, uh, foreign varieties like uh, a Cascade or some. A lot of uh, American varieties that we started to grow, like Amarillo or Cascade, uh, Chinook, they are grown. Uh, they are also grown here in Germany, but it's just uh, um, mostly it's Hercules, it's a Perle, it's a Mittelfrüher, the classic, uh, typical uh, German noble hops that you know that uh, that are widely used in in the classic lager styles. So I mean for. I would imagine the bulk of the production is is the typical Central European noble hops that that many of us are familiar with, right? Right. So mostly, uh, we we grow mostly uh, bittering hops, and of course, mostly Hercules, because that's the flagship worldwide scene, and uh, and uh, aroma hops. So when I when I say aroma hops, I mean not not specific flavor hops, but really a typical noble hops. Typical aroma, noble hops like Perle, Mittelfrüher, Tettnanger, Sarzer, the Sarzer uh, Circle, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. All, all the classic German hops, really. So all the classic German hops. And they they are really, uh, let's say, the importance is still there. And the focus on the typical flavor hops that you know in, in the U.S. is uh, is not that important. That makes sense. Um, how has the uh, uh, you know, the sort of you know kind of hop re revolution and IP evolution here has it has it affected what you grow over there much at all? You mentioned you're starting to grow some of the U.S. varieties. Yes. So uh, first of all, um, the the typical European brewer is uh, basically brews lager beer. Is especially in Germany. Mm -hmm. So if you have a closer look on the market, uh, if you ask an, uh, you, uh, European people what they think about, or if the ask so what is what's cra craft beer, they say ah IPA. So they don't even know that there are other beer styles like a stout or a porter. Yes, basically yeah. the IPA is widely known, but it's not that widespread on the market in the sense of. Um, yeah, it's, it's still sort of a niche market I, over there, I guess, right? Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's Interesting, it. especially in Germany. 
maybe Germany is the place on earth where the, the craft beer has the hardest standing you can you can think. Wow. And so you're, I mean, you're talking about the hop market there. Obviously, you do use a lot of it in Germany, but a large portion of it gets exported. Um, it, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the countries around the world that use your hops uh, to make other beers? Now, look, as as most of eighty percent of the hops are produced in on, in two places, right. in in the U.S. and in Germany, and uh, breweries are everywhere worldwide. So. Of course, hops is export. Has ever been and will ever be, I think. Yeah. So I, I would imagine, uh, I, again, probably used in a lot of lagers all, all over the world, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. If you if you say lager, you say German hops more or less. Not fourthly, of course. Yeah. Um, well, can you walk us through the process of uh, harvesting and pelletizing the hops? Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar. You know, hops are obviously grown on vines, uh, which are uh, similar to vines. They, they grow up a trellis, right? Uh, can you right. walk us through the whole process maybe of, of growing the hops? And then, you know, it, it's got to be a little different because you're, you're working on a family farm. You're processing it uh, probably in a much different way than they do, I would think, in the, the Pacific Northwest where they have, you know, a lot of larger companies and machinery and everything. Yeah, actually, it's the same process as every single farmer needs the same machinery to to harvest, because mm -hmm. uh, you have the trellis, you have the binds where the, the hops in the field. So you 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 bring in harvest time, you bring the the binds to the farm. There they are picked and cleaned, and the clean, fresh, wet hops, so the, the fresh cones, go to the kiln where they are dried. Mm -hmm. After that, they are after three hours. Approximately, they are conditioned, which is uh, that is uh, they are conditioned in terms of humidity, brought to ten percent of humidity approximately, and then they are baled, and they are uh, uh, brought to the cooling house. They are pelletized as fast as possible, of course, and it depends on what the brewer needs. We can answer to any need. Uh, mostly, they want pellets, and they get that. Yeah. And the, the crucial thing about it, uh, quality is you got in the middle of the cone, you got the, the shaft, and close to the shaft, there are those little lupulin glands, and you have to protect them. The quality goes along with protecting those little, those little glands. And that, uh, what can happen, you can squeeze them, you can overheat them, and you have to take care that that can not happen. That's... That's the, that's it. So, so it all comes down to those little glands. I, I assume that's where most of the hop oils are, right? Right. Of course, you need uh, polyphenols too for the light stability, foam stability, whatever, uh, the aroma stability, of course. But uh, you can find that in in the in the leaves of the cone, but also in 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 the middle or nearby the shaft, even in in the lupulin glands. Um, you need also polyphenols, not only lupulin. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, from what I understand, the timing of the picking is crucial and also the handling and processing of the hops afterwards is crucial. How do you make some of those kinds of decisions as a grower? Um, sorry, I, I, I did not understand your question. Okay. Can, can you I, I, what I was saying is, um, um, you know, I know the timing of when to pick the binds is, is, is critical, right, to get, get that perfect. And then uh, also the processing after that and the handling after that is kind of critical too for the freshness of the hops. How, how do you make some of those kinds of decisions when you're, um, uh, you know, when you're deciding when to harvest? Yeah, the, the time window for harvest is uh, depending on the variety. And, and some varieties are really have a very tight, a very tight uh, uh, time window. So maybe two days ago, they, it was too, too fresh, too green, to to nothing, right? Then it's perfect two or three days, and, and four days after that, it's going into garlic or things that you don't want, for example. So the decision is made by, let's say, sen my sensoric... Uh, Let's say, sensory, just, yeah, we'd say yes, sensory yeah. wrap and sniff. Yeah, the classical wrap and sniff. You go to the field, you you open a cone, you 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 wrap it, you sniff it, and you decide. But we we, we got our own lab laboratory where we can measure oil, the oil content, the, the content of total oil, mm -hmm. or the alpha, of course, 
And uh, this is crucial, of course, the alpha and the oil. Yeah, of and, course. Uh, and the nose, <laughs> the wrap and the sniff. So it's a combination, uh, a little bit of science and, and I would imagine a lot of experience, right? Yeah. Uh, the decision for the right uh, uh, date for harvest is not made with a, with a, uh, a GC, you know, it's made with a nose and... And uh, and with two numbers, which is uh, alpha, and uh, and and the oil. So how, how do you measure the hop oils themselves? I, I I'm you know obviously it sounds like you have equipment to measure the alpha acid. Um, how do you quantify and 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 measure the hop oils? The the hop oils are measured uh, as far as I want to know the quantity, so not the quality with water steam distillation. So you got those methods, you got one single method worldwide that is used or widely used. And you can find that in the ASBC, in the EBC in Europe, or in the MEBAC where there are several uh, reglementations that have different numbers. But the process itself, it's the water steam distillation. And there you can measure quite good uh, the content in milliliter, uh, per 100 gram or in percent mm -hmm. however and do those I, I assume do those peak at some point during the growing process or i, I assume you yeah. track them right yes that's it but uh measuring uh measuring the the content of to total oil uh, means that you have to to dry the cones mm -hmm. and uh so this process if you have a, a small batch just a sample it's a uh, it's quite um yeah, time consuming and right. it takes a time consuming to do to do that because wet hops is not really uh, the right way to measure. You have to first dry them. So yeah. it does it does take quite a bit of time then and uh, and again I imagine this is where the experience uh, probably plays a big role, right? Having having right. grown hops all your life. Yeah. So the the as a one thing is crucial. Um, you have to have a certain um, the varieties that you're growing should be the 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 the, the, the perfect time windows should mm -hmm. not overlap, and if they do, it should not overlap too too big. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, well, you're, the right you're scheduling, right? right? You got to worry about scheduling because you have different yeah, varieties in the field, right? Yeah, this is crucial, absolutely. Hmm. And how how many uh, do you, do you grow? Just one harvest a year, or can you get more than one in? No, of course, uh, only one. Only that, one. That would be fine. <laughs> Two harvests, like soya beans in Brazil, all right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, sorry. Well, uh, can you talk a little bit about how your hops are tied to uh, a lot of the traditional German beer styles uh, that people uh, may or may not be familiar with? Yes, of course. It's a, look, uh, the, the typical aroma hops, like, uh, let's say, a Perle tradition, Holletal tradition, Mittelfrühe, that you know, they are really tied to those beer styles. And um, I think 100% of those varieties goes into lager, for example. Right. Was, it, was this the question that you... Uh, well, I was, what I was asking is, is there specific styles that are tied to maybe a particular variety? Uh, Looking on the German market, you find only three beers. It's the Helles, it's the Pils, and it's a wheat beer. And there's no no other beer style. So those are the, those are the three major styles. Yes, they cover ninety nine percent of the market. I did not. I did not know that. I, I you know there, obviously there's quite a few German styles, and I've had had a number of them, but um, but I didn't know it was it was so dominated by just those three styles. That's interesting. Uh, it's really dominated by them, and uh, that's uh, let's say that the, the, the typical German is not really open-minded for new beer styles. Maybe he knows an IPA. He he he, he has he, he, he heard about it. That's not much. Which which hops would you use to make those three styles typically? Basically, the ones I mentioned: the Perle, the Pearl, Perle, Hallertau uh, tradition. Tradition, tradition. Yep. Uh, Holotau Mittelfrühe, maybe Sapphire, Sophia, or uh, Tetnanger, the high fine ones who are in the Sorza circle as a Sorza Tetnanger, and uh, uh, Hesbrucker, of course, and uh, 
all those old uh, land races and uh, varieties. And of course, new breeding lines that are brought out because um, uh, of the just because of the climate change, of course, because those old old varieties, those old old varieties suffer from the lack of water that we have that we that we see in in summer times now. It's hotter and hotter. It's becoming uh, more and more interesting to. So we we do have new breeding lines, who who just so, we so, can talk on. So how does that work? I mean, are you bringing in a new version of the same hop that that's a little more water uh, or a little more drought resistant, or or are you bringing in entirely new breeds or varieties? So the first, as a, talking about climate change and varieties, yeah, is um, is. Uh, goes along with irrigation. So actually, in the last forty years, we irrigation was not 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 at all necessary here in this region. But in the last ten years, I have to say it is absolutely crucial to have ir irrigation. We do have water. There's a certain lack of water in summer times, but in winter time, the resources are filled up with water. It's raining. It's snowing. That's that's fine. But uh, even if you irrigate, those old varieties suffer from that lack of water and and the heat. Hmm. Of course, and therefore we have new breeding lines. But the market, so the brewers, are not very open-minded to to change the, to change the varieties, even if we have them. And uh, if you want to, I can show you exactly what, for example, uh, what new breeding lines are there. They are already available, and some U.S. brewers, for example, know them already. They try them, they they gave them a try, and they um, they. So I learned that they that they are quite uh, um, interested in them, but it takes at least let's say, even if a brewer is more open-minded than a German or a European brewer, mm -hmm. the U.S. brewers are. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that, and even if they are open-minded, they uh, it it takes ten years to introduce a new a new variety. So, I mean, in, in addition to the, you know, like 10 or 15 years it takes to actually develop the variety and get it into the field, there's actually a lag, I assume, in, in adopting new varieties as well in the market, right? Right. So, if you have a closer look on on a certain variety that is uh, ha has found its way into the market, like uh, talking about, uh, uh, it's the same thing in the U.S., uh, it takes... As a, uh, it takes 15 years for breeding, right? To, to really check out all those crucial things that are necessary, that you can say this this variety is sustainable in many ways, agriculturally seen for the brewer, for the whole industry. So right. This so is, that's the, it, the it takes it takes 15 years. So that's the hop. That's the hop development life cycle. I've had guests on that talked about that. It's interesting that you have to go through a process of you know. Making sure it's disease resistant, make sure it's drought resistant, make sure it's, you know, all these things, right? That it produces right. enough hops per acre and so on. Um, yeah. But, you, it. but you're, you're saying in addition to that, there's a, there's a significant delay in getting new hops uh, uh, adopted by the brewers, right? And particularly in Central Europe. Right, that's it. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, we are all in need of new varieties, Mm -hmm. that that can uh, work with this new situation and we have them but it's a strong message out out uh, out uh, to the brewers now uh, uh, give it a try give it a try and uh, uh, give us the chance to for the change and the change is, is it takes time of course so 15 years for breeding 10 years for introduction means uh, 25 we are living in a fast time and we have to have uh, uh, faster quicker better reaction to that yeah but yeah. well it's it's like i understand it tradition stands um have, uh, so it. along with that i mean have you changed your product offering at your farm much i mean you've been you've been growing hops for 10 generations um have you started to introduce uh, new things into your into your uh, your acreage yeah of course uh, every year we introduce new machinery, new techniques. The you know hops means uh, seasonal work means uh, a lot of helping hands that you cannot really uh, substitute by machines. But year by year we have new technologies. This is on the one side, the technical side. Then mm -hmm. on on the on the sales side, let's say in former times 
or yeah, even today, it is uh, the farmer sells the hops to the broker, right? And and there it ends, right? And the craft beer revolution, the craft beer uh, hype. It's not a hype. It's really it, it changed the market forever. I think uh, brought out that we have more communication worldwide, communication between the farmers, communication from the farmer to the brewer. That's new. That's absolutely new. And that that this is what gives new possibilities, unknown possibilities. And it brought us to to let's say to new marketing strategies to new connections to new ideas. We're full of new ideas and not just ideas. We, do, we, we just do it. Yeah. I want to, I actually want to dive into your hops, hops to brew uh, a connection in just a minute. But before we do that, I wanted to go back and just say, um, you know, how do you make a decision as a farmer, you know, what to grow and when to change and how to do it? Uh, growing hops means that you need uh, long-term contracts because growing hops is very costly. Mm -hmm. And you have always to look for contracts. So if you produce only for the spot market, you will you You'll will go broke pretty quickly, I guess, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It it takes two years. You plant the hops, it takes two years, uh then it is in full bloom or it gets the the the, 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 the yield you need. And and therefore it takes yeah, it takes a contract. You have you have to have a contract. That's it. So I so assume decision, you set up, you mentioned the brokers, you're setting up a long-term contract with some broker, I assume, right? Right. So we, there are just a few of them. Uh, there, there is the Bartos group, there's Steiner, there's Yakima Chief. Let's say there are five worldwide. That's mm -hmm. nothing. That's just a, a very small family. And everybody knows, we know each other. Yeah. So small market. of course, uh, it's a small market and we need them and they do a great job because they are the buffer in between you know those problems that can occur like corona because the broker now the broker is really uh, in, a, in a in a hard situation now yeah he's you assuming a lot of the risk and as uh, i assume the same's happened in, in germany but um obviously a lot of the breweries here are under a tremendous amount of pressure because of the coronavirus yeah that's it this situation changes changes a lot, and we don't know yet what what will be in, uh, the uh, what the world will look like in two years uh, or in one year. You were you were you were about to describe to me exactly how you make a decision, uh, you know, next year what to grow. I think, and and so how do you how do you sit down and and decide, you know, that you're going to plant uh, one variety versus another variety that you're actually going to try maybe one of these new varieties. How do you do that? So. As a hop farmer, I need contracts. As uh, planting, uh, planting hops is costly, and it takes two years uh, until I get the full yield. So we need contracts at least for five years, maybe for ten even, depends. And those contracts are given by brokers, uh, historically seen, and um, they they cover cover the risk. So we produce it, we give it to the brokers, and they sell it to the to the, the they process it. So, so do they make those decisions for you? Then is that how that works? I mean, uh, do they kind of decide end, what you grow? Basically, they come up to me and say, "Now, I, we we are in need of a certain variety. Do you have it? Are you willing to grow it for me in the next five years? This is the price." So, this is the classic the classic way how how contracting is done. It's the same thing in in the US, more or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we have we face a new a new year, let's say, yeah, um, uh, because of the craft hype, cra the craft uh, the craft beer brought that that we have a direct contact, and that means that we can sell directly to the brewer and react to the brewer faster, and and therefore we produce hops for this market sometimes just from one year to the other, sometimes for the spot market even, but. Uh, a hop farmer needs contracts. A brewer has to know that. And um, if he wants uh, high quality in a in a in a long term relationship, he has to give uh, contracts. But if uh, things like the Corona crisis uh, occur, is maybe he, he he just cannot fulfill the contract. Of course, it can happen. Yeah. Um. So 
going back, are you? Uh, has there been a lot of innovation in the German market? If you, I mean, because you met, there's only a couple, as you mentioned, a couple big hop distributors. Um, have there have there been a lot of uh, pressure in Germany to start growing some new hops uh, to support the IPA craze and and some of these new varieties coming out? I think the support was not there by the brokers, not at all. It was so. Uh, there, there aren't. Uh, there are new breeding lines mm-hmm. who who are able to answer to that, but they were never put it on the table in the brewery. So that the brokers, the brokers see us as the the, the those who who purchase, who who produce, uh, who produce uh, bittering hops and the typical noble noble hops and aroma hops, and those flavor hops when were not really introduced into the market. So it was on the farmer side. The decision that they um, that they started growing those new breeding lines, new varieties mm-hmm. for IPAs, for example. Mm-hmm. But the, the market itself and the brokers, they they did not want that. Really, not pushing pushing that innovation, at least not in your area, I assume. Yeah, um, that's it. So uh, I mentioned you you launched a new project called Hops to Brew, uh, I think back in 2015. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think this is meant to help uh, sort of uh, short circuit this issue, right? Yeah, Hops to Brew was, uh, the basic idea was a cooperative idea of uh, several young hop growers like, uh, like me. The mm-hmm. idea initially was from me and we, we uh, the idea is to have a, a portfolio of uh, 40 to 45 uh uh, hop varieties as a single farmer has between five and ten varieties mm-hmm. and the decision was uh, um, to to process the hops and to really produce the end products because we had ideas how to do that and we had uh, interested brewers who said could you pelletize softer could you bring out a hop oil could you do this or that and we said well therefore we need a laboratory we need uh, people who are highly educated in terms of chemistry in the laboratory, who know uh, everything on the agricultural side, uh, marketing, you know, social media work, all that. And therefore, we started Hops to Brew. Hops to Brew is an English name because uh, we sell worldwide and mm-hmm. people speak English. That's it. And uh, and how how has the reaction been to hops to brew? Have you, have you been able to get brewers interested? Have you been able to get uh, uh, people interested in the project? Of course, uh, buying hops directly on the farm by, uh, is 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 the look the the idea of of craft beer is the direct contact, regional. It's uh, uh, honesty. It's direct. It's let's say it's. Uh, craftsmanship so they want to be as close as possible to the place where the product comes from the hops yeah there's a big movement course, big movement here in the u.s to use a lot of locally grown ingredients for example um yeah, and, and 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 direct uh having a, this direct line from the brewer to the hop grower to the maltster yeah you know, we had craft malting is taken off here as well so uh can you talk about it some more about how that that relationship has developed and and how people have reacted to the project uh, look, there are beer festivals. I go up to a brewer and say, "Look, uh, my name is Matthias. I'm from Hops to Brew, and uh, we, we 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 get in contact. He f- he comes up to the farm. He finds out that we have a cooling house with 40 different varieties. He can rub, he can sniff. He sees we have a laboratory. Uh, it's just uh, we have exactly the product that he's in need of, and we can react fast to any any wish." So this is just, um, let's say, how do you say, uh, we, 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 we do not do a lot of social media work. Mm-hmm. So our marketing is really poor. It's just a word by the mouth. So, uh, so have you been able to establish relationships now with some of the breweries and perhaps even get, uh, you know, I, some, I know some breweries are large enough to do long-term contracts, right? Right. So uh, at the moment, uh, we we do contracting, but we can also re- react to uh, most of the brewers or a lot of brewers because we have uh, 
let's say we have heaps of hops in the cooling house, uh, 40 different varieties, so we can uh, easily react. And if not, it's if he says, and great hops, we need five tons. And if we have, a, a, if they are not de- there at the moment, I can say, I give you just uh, two, two or 300 kilos, I give it a try. And, uh, and you can sign a contract or, uh, or give an offer for the next uh, harvest, which takes place in three months, for example. So we can react. So is it uh, has this helped uh, to bring a little bit of innovation into the market? And also, uh, I guess maybe it sounds like you're cutting out the distributors, right? <sighs> well, it's uh, hops to brew is somehow special because a lot of uh, farmers try to do the same thing. And Mm -hmm. the problem is that the portfolio of hops that they have is too low. You are a brewer, you you want five different uh, varieties, and we only have two of them. So you say, hey, I want to go there and pick up all of them, all all of them. And this is the, 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 the most important thing is to have all of them in high quality and to react, to re, to react fast. And this is, let's say, um, this is difficult to establish. So it, it it takes time, I would assume, right? Like everything. Yeah, yeah, it takes time. Now the other the other aspect of hops to brew that you mentioned in the notes uh, that you sent me was um, that you also are doing research into new hops and helping to develop new hops and and helping to educate brewers about new hops. Yes, uh, the best example is that we are very close to the hop research center, which is one uh, kilometer, one mile away from here, and they bring out those new breeding lines. They are this is the place where Hercules, where Perle, all those varieties were breeded. And they have new um, new breeding lines that had a number. Now they have a name. That's, for example, a diamond. It's a Aurum. It's a Tango. Tango is the is one of those who got uh, the name right before Christmas, for example, uh, which is a dual purpose uh, variety with a, li- a lightly uh, uh, citrusy mm. um, aroma as well as. Uh, uh, a high uh, capacity for uh, the lager, the lager beers, for example. And they 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 bring out those varieties, they bring it to hops to brew as we can pelletize uh, smaller batches, uh, lower than a ton, for example, and then uh, we, we, inter- we help them even to introduce them into the market. So we are a good place for picking up those new new varieties and to, 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 to just be uh, as close as possible to this proce- process. Hmm. And uh, you know, where are you going in the future with Hops to Brew? Is it, is it continuing to expand, continuing to grow? Yes, of course. So first of all, we, we see the market abroad that is uh, outside of the German-speaking part of Europe. That sounds strange for you, maybe, <laughs> but there, the, there's uh, the living room for the for the craft. Uh, in in Germany, in Germany, it's really hard. So uh, Ger- Germany, I assume, has a strong tradition, right? Yes, that's it. The str- a strong tradition, and it's really how I said the hardest standing for craft that you can imagine. And for example, today we we sent out packages to. Single boxes to Chile, to 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 the Netherlands. Some stuff goes to the, to Korea. Even it's we send it out worldwide on pallets uh, and in boxes. <laughs> so the the German uh, beer market is obviously very traditional, and they have a certain number of styles and 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 hops that they're willing to use. Have you started to see more innovation into you know what we call craft beer here in the U.S.? Have you started see, seeing some of those trends? Uh, take over other places in Europe or, or grow in other places in Europe. Yes, uh, maybe um, every every other country uh, in Europe outside of Germany is very innovative in terms of craft beer. For example, Italy, the northern, uh, north, uh, let's say Bavaria is very close to the Alps. So Bavaria, south of Bavaria, there are the Alps, the natural barrier between Germany and Italy. And south of the Alps, that's quite close in northern Italy, there's a, a strong craft beer craft beer scene with an amazing output and really uh, a huge portfolio of different beer styles. I- incredible, really. So going over to, to Spain or Portugal, for example, it's the same. 
at the moment they suffer they, they do suffer from corona of course but uh, once it started and it started it, it changed the market and uh, following up with the Scandinavian uh, countries as in north of north Europe uh, northern part of Europe uh, they do have uh, they, they love IPAs for example mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the bitter the better yeah in uh, <laughs> Of course. So in, in Eastern Europe, in Poland or those uh, countries in between uh, Europe and Russia, it's the same trend. And even if those people do not have that much money, uh, uh, not that uh, high li uh, living standard, they spend their money on high quality beers. In Germany, the living standard is much higher. People want it cheap. You know, it's well, a very, I was, I very was, uh... sensitive country. One of the things I was amazed at when I went to Germany is I, I believe the beer was cheaper than water, basically. If you want to buy like a bottle of water, it was more expensive than a beer. Yeah, you have to, you have to imagine that you, when you go to the supermarket, you can buy a, a, a whole a box of, of beer, uh, of uh, bottles, and I'm talking about 20 bottles, half mm -hmm. a liter, 10 liter of beer for 9 euro, right? That, that's for incredible. I mean, that's incredible. You can't uh, hear that would... Here they would buy you maybe a six pack. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's really destroying. That's uh, incredible. <laughs> but it is just like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you come up with a can with uh, that is uh, uh, around about five dollar, he says, "Hey, hey, look! I get two cans. I can have ten liters, right?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get it. Yeah, but, but obviously the tax uh, structures and the laws and everything much different. So, um, yeah. So interesting. <laughs> Um, we are seeing a lot of, I mean, I'm seeing innovation worldwide. Uh, South America is growing like crazy. Um, uh, you know, a lot of beer uh, interest to really, really around the world now. Um, I do have a question, though. How, how have you dealt with, uh, we, you've talked about it a couple of times, but the coronavirus crisis, which has uh, obviously had a huge impact on uh, craft breweries and indeed breweries worldwide. That's it, and I can see that uh, those breweries who who have a strong focus on bottles in Europe we use bottles. Cans are widely used in in, in the rest of the world. Um, those who, who who have the focus on bottles and cans will survive if they do a good job. If they have a good way of distributing, that's strongly depending on how that works. But those who have barrels. For example, in, in Germany, you have to imagine Warsteiner. I, I don't know if you know Warsteiner. Warsteiner. Mm -hmm. They have a loss of 55% of barrel beer, and that's just killing them, right? That's that's really a problem. That's Yeah, that's I mean, big... here in the U.S., the big problem we have is the craft breweries in particular. A lot of them uh, serve right out of the tap room, and that's how they make their money, and that has been severely impacted, obviously, due to coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Uh, this is uh, it will not stop stop the the craft beer scene it will not but it will the the constant boom has found a certain plateau if not i don't know you know what i mean yeah and i mean how does this affect you as a hop grower down the line because um i assume you're looking for future contracts even several years out how, how does that uh, has it been more difficult as a traditional as a traditional hop grower, I have to say we got contracts and they last longer than the corona crisis. So we are safe. The brokers has to buffer that. That's a problem for the brokers. So they've taken and a lot of risk in, then, huh? Yes. They, they, they now, they do, they do have a problem, of course. And looking at projects like Hops to Brew, for example, it's even a chance just because the brewers, the brewers, uh, buy by sight you know just what they need if they are in need of if the if the uh, the guest gastronomy the if the the, the brew pubs uh, reopen uh, they will fill up the the storage with hops and we can react very fast and easily so at the moment maybe this is even a chance for us so maybe an opportunity um yes where do you see the german hop market trending in the future I see very, very clear that in the next five years, uh, this very single variety Hercules will dominate will, will dominate uh, the alpha market, 
the bittering hop, the, the market for bittering hops mm -hmm. for lagers. Uh, yeah. Maybe, may, maybe even in the in the next uh, decade, because new varieties coming up in in the US like Pato cannot really compete with Hercules. So you have to see that uh, 80 percent of the of the beer worldwide is just uh, is looking for alpha, uh, right? If uh, And, and and not for of course for aroma, but not for not for the for flavor. And I think you know what I mean. And, yeah, uh, the the big the big breweries here in the U.S. that produce the vast majority of the beer still in the U.S. Uh, are really most interested in in alpha acid, right? So yeah, right, the German market will be dominated by growing uh, bittering hops, as well as uh, aroma hops, uh, classical noble hops. We will change the market. We will substitute those noble hops who suffer from the climate change. We do have those varieties, and we are very proud to offer them to the brewers if they are open-minded. Just ask me. I can uh, I can uh, compare them. I would like to compare them in, in form as a spiderweb diagram or a radar diagram, just to see what the those old noble hops compared to to the new varieties that we have can bring. For the brewer, mm -hmm. so and and then the third part are the flavor hops. We do have those flavor hops, but but they are widely unknown. We have new products out of them, and uh, I think we uh, we have a, we have about 20 different flavor hops, and five of them are quite interesting. And then we will de develop uh, products out of that and offer them to the brewers. But the brewers simply have to be interested in that. And hops to brew is too small to really market to do the marketing for those mm -hmm. uh, great varieties. The brokers will not do that. That's mm -hmm. my that's my uh, not my opinion. It, it, I think it will be like that. <laughs> so we have three three different. Um, um, it's the bittering hops, it's the aroma hops, uh, uh, the the aroma hops, and the flavor hops. Those three parts. Well, you're a 10th generation uh, hop grower, and uh, the audience that I have is mostly home brewers and also quite a few of craft brewers. Um, what would your closing thoughts be to uh, to folks that are that are you know uh, really pretty innovative? A lot of home brewers like to experiment and so on. Um, in terms of German hops, uh, first of all, uh, if somebody wants to give an an uh, uh, a, a certain variety, a, a, a try, or a new product that we produce, we can uh, we can send out samples and react quite quite fast in small quantities as well as in high quantities. If uh, there are products that we have, we have a new product that we call Nectar, we, uh, which is a brand that we brought out. Mm -hmm. That's nothing else but purified and concentrated hops from hops to brew. It's like uh, you know uh, cryo hops or uh, lupul alien two or whatever. Uh, lupulin uh, powder, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah, uh, lupulin powder, and we so we concentrate. We we double the concentration of of uh, alpha and oil. So if you want uh, want for example a certain quantity of hops, we send it out in form of nectar concentrated. You can use this for you, you can use it for bittering as well as for dry hopping, for example, as it is concentrated in aroma and in oil. <laughs> And this is a product that we, we have in mind at the moment. And the good thing about it is that it is uh, quite cheap in shipping. So you can give a try. Uh, we can, uh, for example, one single box is like one complete bale of hops. So it's quite concentrated. This is a product that we sent to South America, for example, mm -hmm. or to, to, to remote places on Earth because the shipping costs can be reduced. And you can, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, great dual-purpose And you can do that with any variety, of course, but this is the best way to introduce, for example, flavor hops into the market uh, and to, to, to give it a try. It's easier to give it a try for the brewers. That's what we do. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, Matthias. It's been a pleasure having you. Me too. Great pleasure. Thanks. Uh, today, my guest was Matthias Seibler. He is founder of Hops to Brew and a 10th generation German grower. Uh, thank you again, Matthias. Thanks a lot, too. Bye. A big thank you to Matthias Seibler for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're offering access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. 
go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 Brewing Software a try. If you've not downloaded the new 3.1 update, grab it now as it includes improved data storage, additional dry hop options, new mash pH models, new add-ons, and much more. To download your free 21-day trial, go to Beersmith.com today. Again, that's Beersmith.com. Dot com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.